Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, at this meeting of the uh, IT Special Interest Group for the FENG. Um, I'm Adriana Odis, uh, the co-chair here. And today we have, our topic is gonna be on demystifying the whole cybersecurity for, uh, and the, the audience is really us, the senior leaders, the C staff and, and our boards. Um, when you talk about the dark web and malware, most people think that the cyber threats are technological, um, technologically denoted. Um, but Kurt, as you will learn from Kurt, um, he's uh, gonna share with us his surprise that most insurance claims show that it's more the internal employees that cause uh, some of the bigger havoc. Um, it's not because they're bad people or they're doing anything malicious, it's just because the company has a bad cyber culture. And uh, as we know, culture always starts at the top. Uh, so the big question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, how are we leading our companies? Um, we're gonna hear from our speaker. He's a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. He has a 15, uh, 15 year veteran. He's the founder and leader of a 400 person cybersecurity practice, practice at Morgan Stanley. Um, he does fight his geekish tendencies um, as a, um, well, he says his words, mediocre musician, uh, but he refuses to give it up. Um, and so without any further ado, we're going to welcome Kurt Vincent. Thank you very much. Um, just before we get started, I do my presentations differently than most, and there are some technological reasons for it. So what you, you you folks need to do is go up to your top right corner of your Zoom and click on the view and put it into speaker mode so that this way I'm the biggest um, biggest square in the room, if you will. Because um, right now we've got Adriana. I don't know why, but she's uh, in the, is uh, dominating that space. But we'll see if we can't figure that out. And my slides, by and large, are just to be able to cue my own thoughts on what I want to be able to say next. So with that said, let's get started. Um, Kurt Vincent, as I said, uh, I'm in a newly formed cybersecurity group called the Cyber Shore Group. And in the, in the um, midst of uh, merging three different organizations internationally, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here and I love talking to senior people. So I'm going to just say one disclaimer before we get started, and that is, um, okay, I'm just getting, are we seeing Kurt? Okay, I'm not sure what's happening here. Um, do we, I let's just, just want to make, make sure you're not seeing me. Yeah, yeah we're seeing you. I'm not sure why. Uh, you, you Do you have the uh, the screen for, I don't want to take too much. Kurt. Kurt, we can see you. Yeah, we see fine. So I mean, I don't I'm know fine. what you're looking at. But yeah. We can okay. See good. Fine. Yeah. Good. Then I just want to drive on. I don't want to waste time. I've got a tremendous amount to go through. I will skip over certain things if I think we're starting to run out of time, but um, I think you'll be able to get something out of it regardless. So I have. Hold on. I got to be able to click there. Okay. Now I do have two disclaimers, and uh, one of the things I like to tell people is that when I joined the army, my father forced me to quit high school and join the army on my 17th birthday. Turned out to be the best darn thing that ever happened to me. And the army was really good at helping me get my GED and my high school diploma. And then I went off to start um, uh, my educational career. And I was an aviator. I was in helicopters. And so therefore I worked my way up to starting to work on an engineering degree in um, aeronautical engineering. And one of the things that we had a poster in our operations was a quote from Will Rogers, who is a great American cowboy philosopher. And he said, everybody is ignorant only on different subjects. This has become my guiding principle for speaking to anyone. Because there's a lot of people on this call that know a whole lot more about things that I don't know about, and I shouldn't feel stupid. And I know things that others don't know about, and I shouldn't be arrogant. So we're going to approach this whole thing as friends and, and partners. But one more disclaimer, and that is the moment you take the fact that a retired Army Colonel, crusty Army Colonel, as I like to say, I'm a war veteran. Unfortunately, it was a civil war. And uh, I've been around for a long time, but on Wall Street for, the, for over 20 years, the bulk of that was at Morgan Stanley, where I founded the uh, cybersecurity program, 15 years there, and uh, finishing up my, my, my Fortune 500 career at Bank of America. Now, I, I bring this up not to impress you, but to impress upon you that when you take 
all of this stuff that I've done, and then you take cybersecurity, we have a tendency to make it sound like I'm scolding or I'm yelling. It's not the case. It's the nature of cybersecurity type of activity. And I'm not scolding. We're going into this as friends. And so let's attack the topic um, as, as gently as we can. Now, let's start this out. I want you to imagine it's a Friday afternoon. You're starting to think about what you're going to be doing over the weekend. Maybe you can round a golf, play some tennis, or maybe your, your partner is home packing the kids up, ready to go off to the mountains to spend the weekend. And you're de starting to drift in the daydream. And then suddenly, though, you're starting to notice your computer is getting real sluggish. You can't figure out what's going on. And then the printers stop operating and it gets real eerie and quiet in the entire office. The next thing you know, there's a scream down a hole. You jump up out of your chair, you run on down, and you look over the person's shoulder and you see, boom, something really bad. Oh my gosh, the company has been hit with ransomware. Now I will tell you right now, most companies don't know how to handle ransomware. And, the, and I'm not gonna go into detail. I'm not gonna go into detail. I'm just gonna tell you that most companies feel that it's never gonna happen to them and that they're totally, totally protected which is usually not the case. But uh, as a for instance, most people will then start shutting down computers, which means you've lost all of your forensic um, uh, activity, or you'll immediately pay the bad guys their, their Bitcoin and what will happen unless you've got a good third party negotiation um, uh, brokers actually, and I use two different ones. You, you will probably end up paying the ransom, which can be Depending upon your company, I just got done working with a company that paid millions and millions. It's classified. but And then what happens is, is that they don't even give you anything. They just say, thank you very much, and they go off golfing. So the whole thing is we want to be able to approach this topic as saying it can happen to any of us and none of us are exempt. So I love speaking to senior people. I'm spending a lot of time with boards these days because of different regulatory uh, things that have happened very recently where boards are now being held for fiduciary responsibility and they can't hide behind it. So we brought, we, uh, we brought a CISO in, It's the, the board members are now being uh, held responsible, fined, and actually a cases of going to jail. So I wanna be able to demystify cybersecurity. I wanna be able to take you through and explain some of the threats and take out all the gobbledygook and the geeky stuff and let's just get one thing clear. I am a card certified geek, electrical engineer and a master's in digital communications. And um, I love geeky stuff, but the more senior I become, the more I've learned, as I like to say, uh, you've, <laughs> and I just used this last week, I got flown down to the Bahamas to, to, to address a room full of CISOs. And I looked at them all and I said, look, I'm just like you, but I realized if you want to be, ever be promoted again, you got to graduate from geekdom. So we're going to leave geekdom behind and drive on as senior leaders. What are we going to talk about? We'll talk about a few threats. We'll talk about password vaults and some correlated data, blah, blah, blah. But we're not going to discuss what's known as GRC, Governance, Regulatory, and Compliance. And this is primarily for two reasons. One, it has to do with, when you get into GRC, it has to do with the type of business you're in. Well, the kind of regulatory for healthcare is different than financial, different than, uh, we'll say, transportation, and also where you're located, things that are different between being in New York City, where I was for 20 years, or uh, the regulatory within California, or overseas for like uh, the uh, London and GRC and et such. So we're not going to talk about that. But let me start off by something that happened to me about about 15, 20 months ago, and I thought, oh my gosh, from this experience, I have to share this. And I got brought into a company, $60 million, uh, happened to be a, a um, quarry company that sell, sells stone. It happens to be in Pennsylvania, where I've relocated in the last eight months. But I was brought in, the CIO, I had a good relationship with the guy, went through, and when we sat down and said, this is what your, your exposures are and all, he says, look, let me, get, let me, let me set the tone. He goes, we're, we're, I know I've got old gear. A lot of it is end of life. I, I know a lot of my computers haven't been patched, but he goes, Kurt, the bottom line is the criminals don't want my data. I smiled. I looked at him and said, you're absolutely right. These days, there's so much data on the dark web. It's gotten so cheap. They no longer care about data as much. 
they care about three things. First and foremost, they want to be able to use your computers, your memory, your cooling systems, your electricity to be able to mine Bitcoin behind your back and you don't even know. This is known as crypto jacking. The second thing, everybody sees this on TV, and that is the ransomware. They want you or one of the employees of your company to click on something and then they get a huge payday for doing very little. But the third thing they want to be able to do is use your company. They are able to penetrate your company. You don't know they're there. They use it as a springboard to attack the next company to be able to do the ransomware and the Bitcoin mining. And the main thing is, is that if another company has better cybersecurity than you, and their CEO or CISO call you up and say, why is your company attacking our company? Now you got a branding issue. That's really, really huge. So these are the things, this is what you need to be able to worry about. Now, if you get into a room like I was last week, you get into a room full of CISOs, you ask them, what is cybersecurity? If you've got 100 CISOs, you're going to get 100 answers. And there's a reason for this. And that is the whole field of cybersecurity is evolving as we speak. I hate to mention this, but I've been involved in cybersecurity since, oh, gulp, 1985, when the ARPANET was uh, transforming within the government, and I was with the Army. And um, today, it's morphed, in, and you ask a whole bunch of people, as I said, you'll get different answers. So for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to call cybersecurity, which was called different things up until about five years ago. We're going to say that cybersecurity is the IT security component. This is the geeky stuff. This is what most people are very familiar with. It's also the information security, InfoSec. We'll talk a lot about this later. This is the stuff that, as far as I'm concerned, this is not being addressed today, and it's a real, real problem. And then we're not going to talk about, but it's part of cybersecurity, is the GRC. Now, let's first clear the decks and say, what makes cybersecurity unique? Well, unlike other types of parts of the business, you're a cost center. And that's never a good place to be because they're, you're always trying to be able to prevent the spend and cybersecurity spend right now is off the charts. The next thing, and this is my favorite part, this is the way senior leaders usually see uh, the CISO when, when he or she is coming to speak to you. It's all gobbledygook and it's a bunch of fun, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so this, as I like to say to the room, uh, like I spoke to last week, you got to be able to graduate from geekdom and move on. Another is that within any organization, regardless of how big it is, the cybersecurity people are seen as what they do is very mysterious. And the other technology groups or even business groups are paranoid because they see you as the secret police, the Gestapo, or the just say no people. Another thing is that cybersecurity is unique because you don't see anybody breaking through a window. What you see is that an attack, if it's done technically, it's usually instant and it's anonymous. You don't know where it's coming from and you don't know who's doing it. This is an actual long, long, long topic that I really can't get into. I have it here just to be able to say that one of the last papers I wrote for the Command and General Staff College with the Army was I wrote a paper called, What is a Combatant in the Cyber World? And in this, I made it very, very clear that back in the day of, of bullets and, and such, which we still have, but you can you considered a combatant to be somebody who is in uniform on enemy ground, boots on the ground with a weapon. And my argument in this paper was that's no longer the case in the cyber world. First of all, it's instant anonymous, as I described earlier. And the example I gave in the paper was you could take a 70-year-old guy who's working for the Army, who's been contracted to be able to open the sluice gates of a dam in Iran, which is going to flood out a military facility that's down in the valley. And I, in this particular case, I just made it Iran. And I said, well, sit, let's just say in Iran, their, um, their, their intelligence organization was able to figure this out. So they send a sniper to an adjacent apartment in Brooklyn, and they take this guy out before he's able to click on a mouse. And the argument is, is a combatant? I successfully argued that he is a considered a combatant. And I want to make it very clear that we have to be able to approach cybersecurity in place in a way that we have not seen uh, as any kind of warfare. 
And then I'll just say very, very quickly, in the government, we used to do a thing where we would allow people, uh, bad guys, to come in to be able to watch what they're, watch what they're doing, learn with what's called TTPs, which is just basically their skill sets, watch their signature in terms of their behavior to be figure out if they're Russian, if they're Chinese, who they are, what they're doing. But that's not the way we do things in the civilian sector. In the civilian sector, if anybody's trying to get in, you keep them out. You don't give a uh, hoot about what... Well, who they are, what they're doing, the name of the game is just keep them out. So since cybersecurity is very confusing, I've, I've come up with an analogy because everybody always thinks of cyber as the guy with the hoodie who's in Lebanon trying to break into a bank in Chicago. And while that does happen, that really isn't what cybersecurity is all about and where it's going. So I came up with an analogy one night when I was washing dishes, my wife Life does the cooking, I do the dishes. And I suddenly had this thought about a factory, an old dangerous factory that, that it was like an OSHA nightmare. And I want you to imagine a great big Megatron up on the wall. And it says 297 days since our last accident. Well, this the, the CEO and the president, they brought in a person and said, you are now our safety officer. And this woman got hired to be able to make sure that that Megatron will move to 298 days. So she comes in and she's ready for the shift to start. The buzzer goes off and she runs around the, the operations floor here, the, the machine room, pulling people's fingers and toes out of machines to be able to prevent any sort of accident. Then she runs on out to the office, office area where she get, makes sure that the janitor has put up those little yellow signs that say slippery or wet runs out to the loading dock and makes sure that the forklift doesn't drop any kind of thing on anybody's toes, comes in and collapses in a heap at 5 p.m. when the shift is over, looks up at the, at the wall and has, is rewarded with the Megatron scene 298 days since our last accident. However, what she's kind of looked forward to is in another entire day of going through that same thing. And what she's got is she's got a project. It's got a beginning, it's got an end. And oh, by the way, when they decide to go to 24 hour shifts, she's in trouble. So if she's smart, she goes to senior leadership and says, you know what, we got a better way of doing this. Let me teach all of the workers how we can prevent accidents and have everybody look out for each other. And oh, by the way, we also need to come up with an incentive program, which I'll talk more about later, to be able to reward our employees when they end up and when they end up um hitting that 500 day mark let's have a big picnic let's have a, a big kegger out in the back and reward the the individuals now in a company i was brought into in the last couple of years it was a big insurance company and in this insurance company they they do all sorts of insurance but they do cybersecurity as well and they want to be able to build a cybersecurity practice to be able to do consulting for their clients that got penetrated or had some sort of issue. So the first thing I wanted to be able to learn is what were the threats? And this was a great experience for me. So I went to the lady who was responsible for claims, everything, all sorts of claims, everything from shipping to cyber. And I said, I'm only interested in cyber. Let's talk about your claims. She brought in what's called the quants. These are the smart guys that are able to go through all of their data to be able to figure out where the threats are. And I said, I want to know where the biggest threats are actually within you know, the claims that are being put in. Uh, uh, can you run an analysis in the quads? Everybody just laughed. They said, Kurt, we can do that for you right this minute. And they said, this is the bottom line. They said 82%, and now this is a huge insurance company, can't tell you which one, but a huge insurance company like Travelers. Travelers was a partner company. 82% are people that click on something they shouldn't. Doesn't mean they're bad people, it just means they shouldn't click on it. And it ends up causing some sort of havoc that then leads to a claim. Another 8% are insider threat. These are the bad guys. These are the people that are either trying to steal something or they're disgruntled and they wanna be able to do damage, steal something. Um, there are employees. So what this means is 90% are internal threats. TV, CNN, and the movies, they will tell you that it's, you know, they'll make you believe it's all the geeky stuff. 
And it's actually, that comes down to just 10%. And this is empirical, and this is proven by the insurance claim. So as the old Pogo cartoon says, we've met the enemy and he is us. This I'm gonna just talk about just for no more than a minute. I just wanna be able to make a point. And everybody has used endpoint uh, security, things like, uh, there's, there's, there's gobs of them out there like Carbon Black and um, uh, uh, plenty of others. There's like 15 of them. And basically what the problem with this sort of software is that it's designed in such a way that it, that it allows the user to just behave the way they normally behave and then they're protected. Now, this, what this means is, is that you're trying to protect your users in the same way as this example here of a, of, a, of a dog that's attacking an attack suit. And EDR is equivalent of like an attack suit. And if, if the dog, everybody knows this, if the dog were to continue to attack this guy, eventually they're gonna get through the suit. And the same thing is true with EDR. And the industry is slowly, slowly starting to move away from EDR. To further push my point, We've got a whole lot of border, company border protection, such as firewalls that keep out bad guys. We've got data leakage, which keeps data from going out. And once again, this has got to do with just preventing people from doing things they shouldn't. And then we've got web pop proxies. And you prevent your employees from hitting porn site, criminal skills, hate site. There's 50 different types of categories that the technical people can set up to say what they're gonna block. But the point is, you're preventing people from going somewhere. They're not, you're not training them to say, if you go these places, there's a problem. So I'm not, that, there's a whole long talk that I have behind this. I just wanna be able to make it the point that this is us all trying to use geeky stuff to prevent people from doing things uh, that they shouldn't. I'm gonna tell you a story now about a guy by the name of John Cilio. John Cilio is in the National Speakers Association uh, I'm a member of NSA. I like to joke and say there's two different NSA, the National Security Agency, which I've been involved in as a geek in the security field. And then there's the National Speakers Association. Uh, my joke is one speaks for a living, the other listens for a living. But John uh, tells a story. Uh, John's a, a really big cyber speaker. And he tells a story and he gave me permission to use the story about how uh, and it, he had a company, a software company, nothing to do with cybersecurity. And basically he was really successful. He went off and bought a new house. And when he got in the new house, he took all of his application data for the mortgage, threw it all in the trash and uh, didn't think about it. Got rid of it. I, I got my house, I'm done. What he didn't know is that there are organizations out there that look for people that just bought new houses and they cruise the neighborhood until you start throwing things out after you've moved in. And in the middle of the night, they show up with a van that looks like it's part of the uh, garbage collection people. And they jump out of the van, they throw all your garbage in the back of the van. And they do this for a couple of weeks, uh, collecting all your trash. They take it to a warehouse, sort through, and they look for stuff. And they found John's uh, mortgage application. And so therefore, John became uh, identity theft victim. And basically, he ended up losing over $300,000 and his company had to fold because of all of the things that occurred. A lot, a lot of story behind this, but I use this to be able to make the point that in this case with what John did, he did something that had nothing to do with geekdom and the way the criminals collected the data had nothing to do with geekdom and he was a victim. This has all got to do with information security type of activity and we, we need to be able to talk more about this. Really, really quick. I love this. This is uh, my, my kids when they were small. Um, I no longer have kids. I now have adults. But uh, we, I used to take them to Chuck E. Cheese to uh, play the game that they loved, Whack-A-Mole. And I just want to be able to talk to you about the, the, the thing that operating systems, that's what the OS stands for, what they're up against in uh, trying to do all the patching they go through. And by the way, before I go any farther, I'm gonna tell you, I think they do a phenomenal job given what they're up against. And I just wanna show you what they're up against. The chart on the left shows you the evolution of operating systems. Top little corner, you can't even see it, little tiny line. That's how many lines of code the original versions of like Microsoft had. And then you can see as you go on down to the very, very bottom, the green line that wraps around uh, five different times will go off my screen. I, so that, 
That's the way it had to be presented because the lines of code is just off the charts. And so every time what happens is when companies, I don't care which version of operating system, when they patch because of the size of their, their code base, it's not on purpose, but the moment they close one hole, a couple of other ones open. And then there's a race between the bad guys and the good guys to find the new ones. Now, just to be able to make this point, basically a million lines of code is size of the book, War and Peace. So just imagine that. And your Android, your Android phone has the equivalent of 10 to 15 War and Peace books and your little phone you can carry around. A Windows machine has 50 million lines of code, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. I think they do a really good job in the overall scheme, keeping it safe. And then Apple has even more of 80 million lines. Now I'm just gonna take a step back and most people say, oh yeah, I use Apple at home because it's safer than Microsoft. That is not true. And the reason I say this is, is that it's a misnomer. 75% of the computers in the world, if you look at business and personal, 75% are actually all Windows. And so therefore, as um, uh, there was a bank robber by the name of Willie Sutton, and when he was caught and he was going, taken away in handcuffs, one, one reporter asked him, Willie, why do you rob banks? And he answered, because that's where the money is. So all of the malware is actually written for Windows machines but there is plenty of malware that are written for Linux and Apple machines. So let's get that off the table. I'm gonna blast through this slide, but I just wanna be able to make it clear that when you think of a fire department, you think of the guys that jump on a truck and they come and they put out the fires of, of your house, your neighbors or whatever, but they also do something else. They do a lot of work with prevention. When they're not doing their job of, of fighting fires, they're usually out, especially paid fire departments, going around to factories, looking for potential fire hazards, uh, uh, greasy rags in the corner, blah, blah, blah. So they're all about uh, prevention. They really don't wanna respond because that's way too late. What we do in the technical field is we, within when I say technical, as, as cybersecurity geeks, we come in and we think we have all the answers with the technical approach and we start putting in the firewalls and all the EDR and all this other stuff. The first thing we usually do is, as geeks is we say, oh my gosh, we need to be able to build an incident response program, which is the equivalent of like the fire department, but we don't do a good job of building prevention. We don't do a good job of focusing on people. And the big thing, my big bugaboo for lack of a better word is the fact that most cybersecurity people do not consider cybersecurity in the overall approach. And I'm gonna drive this home with a quick story about uh, a company I was brought into a re relatively recent when I struck out on my own. And I'm not gonna go into too, too much detail on it, but this company was 750 million. And uh, the company brought me in after a breach and they said, you know what? We really don't have a good cybersecurity program. They didn't have any cybersecurity program, but we need to build one. We need your help. Let's build it from the ground up. So I did. Took a long time, but they, they were happy to pay me to be able to build that. And I was actually on a team that helped hire the CIO. And when they brought the CIO in, after he got established and after I was ready, I said, okay, we got to sit down and start talking about the physical security aspects. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. I want nothing to do with physical security. And I looked at him across the table. And I said, why? He said, I don't get compensated for physical security. Well, I, if I was in charge, if I was with this company, if I was still on the staff, I would make sure this guy got fired because you have to worry if you're everybody has got to worry about everything. And that's kind of the point in why I use the example of the safety officer who says it's everybody's responsibility and it's all different aspects. Now, I'm going to drive this home in the next couple of slides. I was stationed out of Fort Huachuca, Arizona, the home of the Intelligence Corps for a number of years. And right there on the border, we used to go down uh, shopping in Mexico. And when you would come back in to, from Mexico, you would have a long, long way. You can see the top left-hand corner. You can expect to sit in lines for hours. The, the security on our Southern border 
regardless of what the news tell you is, I have tremendous respect for the Border Patrol. If you go through one of their portals, they have got guns, they've got dogs, they have got machines that can sniff uh, to see if there are, when I say sniff, you know, the equivalent of an x-ray, they can tell if people are bringing in drugs, they're bringing in ammunition, they're bringing in nuclear type of uh, uh, devices and components for making nuclear weapons. It is a bear to get through our southern border. But most people know that the bad guys, that uh, the terrorists that came through 9-11, they came through the northern border. And they came through a place called Coburn, uh, Coburn Gore, Maine. This is a picture of the border that uh, in Coburn Gore, Maine, where the terrorists came through. And this is what it looked like. It looks like a gas station. I can just see the terrorists driving out up, roll their window down, talking to a border guy, just ask him a couple of questions and writes on it and says, have a nice day. And they drove on in and they were inside our country. Now, I mention this because of the fact that once you get into our country, we do not have checkpoints at all of the different states. You are inside, you can go anywhere you want. You're free to move about the country. And guess what? This is identical to what happens if you can get inside of a company's borders. So, one of the things I have done and, and to, to companies, and this one particular company is a story I love to tell. And that is, we were hired to be able to penetrate uh, and, and work on some things, some problems the company had. But we wanted to be able to make it clear that they were not as secure as they thought they were. Big New York company, they have uh, guns and badges, as we call them, in, in um, New York City. So the way we penetrated this company is um, I had a woman on my staff who was a brilliant cybersecurity engineer. She also was excellent at a, a, a part of cybersecurity called social engineering that the bad guys use. And so she had to be good at that to be able to understand what bad guys techniques are. And so with her permission, I went out and I bought a UPS uniform. You can see this on eBay. I usually, before I give this talk, I go on eBay the night before and just make sure you can still find a uniform. And uh, so here's a uniform for eBay. I bought it for 34 bucks. I handed it to her. She took it to her favorite New York City tailor and had it fit like a glove. Now this woman was not just brilliant, she was drop dead gorgeous. And I like to use the example of James Bond and the Russian spy that is always drop dead gorgeous. So this woman was that equivalent. We drove out to a suburban business office where they had a, a, an office that was set up just to be able to have the geeks where there was no need for reception because the geeks just let themselves in and out the door and they just had to have a badge. We went during lunch and we got her, and by the way, I was gonna Photoshop a pretty face on there. I just stuck the face on the, uh, on the box, but you get the idea. So this woman was a gorgeous uh, UPS person walking up to the, the company during lunch and the geeks fell over each other, opening the door and she just batted her eyebrows and said, thank you gentlemen and walked inside, set the boxes down, then proceeded to go through a lot of the different cubes, flipping keyboards upside down because everyone knows you people write their, their credentials on uh, little post-it notes in the bottom of the keyboard. And if she found one, she then took a picture of it, took a step back, took a picture of it with her phone, took a picture of the cube with the name on the cube. Why'd she do that? We knew this particular company used first initial lat name at company.com. So now we had a set of credentials, name, password, and this company did not use multi-factor authentication. And we harvested 20 credentials. And going back to the senior leaders saying, what does this have to do with technical? Nothing. This has to do with a bad cyber culture where people should have been said, you know, they, the one thing I love with this story, none of the guys looked to see where the UPS truck was. You know, we showed up in my Toyota Camry. So anyway, the whole point is this makes the point that you're able to get in and collect some data. And oh, by the way, if you ever saw the old movie, and not the Wolf of Wall Street, but Wall Street uh, with, with Charlie Sheen, who was Bud Fox. If we had more time, we would have penetrated the cleaning team and then gone in at night where nobody would question what we were doing as we shuffled things around on a desk. 
um, and even if it was on the security cameras. One other thing, just to be able to make it clear that we've done is we've gone in to a reception and asked a question that was just a bogus question. They answered the question and we were scoping out the lobby. What we did was is that we saw that in the lobby, there was a telephone for guests. And so we came back the next day with uh, uh, starched uniforms, if you will, with white, with white uh, hard hats and uh, khaki pants. And we walk up to, with a clipboard, the reception with some bogus paperwork and said, yeah, we're here to fix that phone. You please sign this. I need to be able to prove my boss I was here. Invariably, they always sign. We went over, we disconnected the phone, which was a VoIP phone, which was connected in network. And we used our tools to be able to exploit their networks um, <laughs> using our security tools. Another story we like to tell is how we uh, penetrated a um, an organization by showing up and doing the same sort of routine with a bogus clipboard. They said, we want to be able to get into their data center. They said, okay, but you have to be uh, escorted. No problem. Please escort it. They escorted us in. We sat down near where we could plug in and no one challenged us. And our guard, our escort stood there on his phone, playing with his phone, talking to his friends as we went off and, uh, collected all sorts of data that we could use as attack data. Point is, this is once again, a failure of the culture. Now, I'm gonna switch gears real quick and I'm watching the clock, but I just wanna be able to share with people, when, when you think of the internet, you don't realize there's actually three layers. And these three layers are known as um, the surface layer, which is where we all live. This is Google, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. And this is uh, actually one of the smallest parts of the overall internet. The largest part of the internet is what's known as the deep web. Now, a lot of people confuse deep web, dark web, so that's why I'm explaining this. The deep web is the most biggest part of the internet. And what the easiest way to understand what that is, is that this is any part of the internet that you need to access with a password. So any sort of, um, uh, where where your dental records are or, or any sort of your banking, blah, blah, blah. This is all the deep web. It's it's uh, You can penetrate it, but it's, it's uh, not something you can just bounce into. Then there's the famous dark web. And the dark web is not as big as you think. And uh, you it's, it's where all the evil, evil stuff happens. And I'm going to speak about it just really, really quick, quickly. But the dark web is where the, the bad guy activities occur. And um, it gets more, it gets more pressed than it really should, but it does exist. And all I'm gonna tell you in the interest of time is that to be able to access the dark web, you can't get there using your Chrome browser and such. You need to be able to use a special plugin for uh, a particular browser. And it's, you use this thing called Tor. And it's known as the onion router. And I want to make the point here of saying the onion router came out of the U.S. Navy, where they developed this particular technology for politically oppressed individuals. So that if you're a good guy living in the country of Iran and you want to be able to get to CNN, you can't get there. It's blocked. They don't want you to hear the truth. Then what you can do is, is tour to be able to get through and I'll explain how it works in just two seconds or less, but to be able to get through and be able to get to, to sites that you wouldn't get to see. But the bad guys use it for evil things. Now, the Navy designed this so that their um, operatives, their spies, were able to be able to collect data, go to a, a kiosk in a, in a foreign country and sit on the kiosk and be able to send their data safely back to the Navy intelligence operations. But the bad guys use it for their... Um, ill gotten gains. And, you know, I like, like to be blunt and say a sledgehammer can be used to hurt someone or to build a house. So this is just a case of the bad guys have just taken this router, this thing called the onion router, and they use it by the way it works. And I don't have time to go into detail is, is that you use this plugin and basically it encrypts every link of the way. And one link only knows where the previous link is. It doesn't know where you came from and it passes the data through and it comes out at the distant end and at the very distant end called the exit relay, it turns it back into normal decrypted and then it connects to the distant end. And uh, the distant end things it thinks it's coming 
from the exit relay. Remember this particular point when we get to VPNs and, uh, and such. So we'll get there later. Now, I'm not going to spend any time on here. All I want you to understand is that you probably have seen these pop-ups that are occurring. This is because of law. You have to be able to click that says, I accept, or I'm going to go through your long, boring um, connections where I decide what you can and can't do. Cookies, all I want you to understand about cookies is that cookies are a little tiny piece of code that sits on your browser, and we permit them. And what they do is that they allow companies, bad guys, et cetera, to be able to track where you're going, what you're doing. And there, it's not necessarily good or evil. It just is. But the main thing is, is that uh, it, like if you, as a, for instance, you've logged into, we'll say Amazon, and then you go away, you come back and you log in again. It says, oh, I remember you. It's, it hasn't been that long. That's because of your cookies. And it, cookies are used to be able to figure out what you're interested in, where, you, where you're looking for, what you're browsing. And it usually the Amazon's the easiest example that if you're looking for a whole bunch of camping stuff, the next time you show up on Amazon, guess what? Also up in the corner, all sorts of camping stuff is flashing by. So it's for targeted sales, it's for doing things like shopping carts. And uh, the companies, by the way, they're not allowed to share that data. Doesn't mean they do it illegally, but they can't share that data. And I can't connect to your, if you were to connect to my website, I can't ask for other companies' cookies. It doesn't work that way. So at least you're protected in that regard. Not going to spend any time in this slide. This is much more geeky, but this is what the, the cookies looks like. And uh, it's just a bunch of uh, stuff in the database on your browser. So the point here is, and this is a good question. Have you ever Googled yourself? Not from a, a vain point of view, but have you ever Googled yourself to see what comes up? And I have to tell you, um, something that I did early on in the days of the internet is I would Google myself and I found stuff about me that went way back to 1987 to the ARPANET or what's also known as the MILNET when I was still with the military in uniform and things that I had done because this thing, uh, because of the cookies and the different sort of data that has been collected and then stored in a different database over the years. It is unbelievable if you really dig in and, and add enough context about yourself, what you find out and what others can find out about you. The thing is, is that when you start to put together things like your phone with most of us know because of GPS, and when I talk about there is not so much that any there's access to your phone, but if you post pictures on things like Facebook and you haven't turned off your GPS, then I can look at posters you've uh, uh, pictures you've posted on Facebook and other things, and I can learn through through um, free software where you were when you took these pictures. I can also tell from people that leave restaurant reviews, your likes on different things, comments and opinions. And by the way, let me be clear, I'm guilty of this too. I sometimes give book reviews and such, and I shouldn't, but I do it. Comments and opinions, Sales profiles, they do this, so they want to be able to target you for sales. And I call this breadcrumbs that, that can be correlated together to be able to be used for attack vectors so that either people use them to sell you something or they use it to be set up what's called a kill chain to be able to do something bad. This is out there and we need to be able to, I, I have to train my, my kids, my wife, and my wife is a, a retired Spanish teacher now in her second career as a marriage and family therapist. And when we married 10 years ago, she used the same password for everything, Pancho 25. It didn't matter if it was banking or her Facebook. And the first thing I got her to do is to understand, you need to stop this behavior right now. You're gonna put our family at uh, odds. So I've given you all the bad news. Let's talk about the good news and the things we can do. These are some of the stuff I'm gonna blast through in the next 15 minutes. I'm gonna leave some time for questions as well. But basically I wanna make it clear, real clear, that in the event of a breach, you need to have good backups. And I wanna make this clear. The reason this slides up here is to be able to say, cyber is one thing. Operational integrity is something different where you need to be able to partner with the ops people, et cetera. And cyber is so often disconnected and, and it's, I, it's with, I, I have a whole lecture I speak about on this. I teach also, 
um, at the undergraduate graduate level. And one of the things is, is that I make it clear, cyber should be part of the overall strategy. And I'm not gonna talk about backups. I'm just gonna say, if you don't have backups, you're in trouble. Um, one of the things that is now becoming much more popular is companies are starting to understand uh, the value of having phishing exercises. This is my favorite company. There are other companies. There's uh, Proofpoint, Wombat, who got bought by Proofpoint. And I'm not endorsing, I don't get a penny, but I'm just gonna use this one as a, an example. Because, 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 most companies will have their geeks who say, don't pay for it. I can go to a university and get a free version of doing a phishing exercise. Don't do it. There's a real good reason for this. First, you're not paying your people to do this sort of thing. It gets very expensive as they're fine tuning this when you can just pay a company like Proofpoint or Noble for be able to do it for you. Now let's dig in. The main thing is that's good about it. And when I come into a company, the first thing I do is I bring in Noble for and I do a sweep and it's we do what's called a baseline. And what we find out very, very quickly, even though the CISO or the chief security officer and the CEO, they're all saying to me, don't worry, our company is pretty secure. And the very first thing is they find out that they're mortal. And most companies, the click rate industry-wide is somewhere between 27 and 33%. I was with the No Before guy last week in the Bahamas, and he was saying, don't tell people 27%, it's 33 to third, one in three people. And uh, regardless of what it is, it's a very high number and it only takes one click. The company that I was most recently brought into and I built the uh, security program, they gave me seven people who were their top technologists. And we started to bring in uh, Noble 4. And the thing I used as a template to be able to do the phishing exercises, I knew there was a, a softball game coming up. And I said, let's use the fact that there's a softball game coming up and have people say, here, please click on this to be able to say what you're going to bring to the company picnic. And um, all the guys, the, the seven guys who were all technologists and they were being converted to cyber, they all said, that's cheating. You're using insider information. I laughed and I said, what do you think the criminals do? If you're going to be in the cyber, you need to think like a, like a criminal and you need to understand if a company is being, if, if criminals want to be able to really target a company, they'll actually drive out and they'll do dumpster diving like I described with the companies taking the, uh, taking the, the bad guys, taking the trash. So you need to be able to think about the fact that it's not cheating. It's all uh, fair and love and war. Something I'm finally starting to see is that companies are now starting to put into place um, rules. Some of the bigger companies and financial companies are starting to put in place rules that say, if you fail phishing exercises three times in a year, you're gone. And it doesn't matter if you're the CEO or if you're the janitor ordering um, um, paper towels. It doesn't matter because it doesn't matter where who clicks. Um, everybody is uh, primarily a, a liability. And this is my biggest challenge when I come into a company is to make you understand the fact that um, it doesn't matter if Fred's been with the company for a thousand years and he's, he's very viable. If he has failed a fishing exercises six times over the last year, then Fred is probably going to take you out. And by the way, the more senior you are, the higher the probability that you're going to make a mistake because CEOs, CFOs, all senior people have to go through 300 emails a day. So they're clicking on everything and um, not, not doing the things you need to do. Not throwing rocks, it's just a statement of fact. Uh, we're gonna talk about password vaults real quick. And uh, password vaults are wonderful. If you don't know what they are, you need to find out. There's about 15 good ones on the market right now. And uh, up until very recently, um, I've been recommending LastPass. I've been using it for like, uh, I don't know, 12, 15 years. Um, however, they got breached in the last six months. And so I'm moving my own company off LastPass and uh, no longer recommending it. There's nothing wrong with LastPass. I, I've just got, I'm just concerned with the branding. Um, I don't want to be associated with a company that's uh, um, had this issue. And just if you use LastPass, don't worry. If you've got a great password, the bad guys can't get your data because LastPass doesn't keep your master password. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, me personally, I'm starting to use uh, moving to 
uh, one password. Whenever I do government work, I have to use Keeper because it's uh, FIPS 140. N none of these are bad. I was using Zoho for a while. Get one, learn how to use it. And so we're, let's go dive into this. Real, real quick, here's the way it works. You only have to memorize one password and you make it a doozy. Now, these examples are last pass. I'm going to change them to something else. But in the interest of time, this is just the way it works. You have to have your credentials and you put in your big, ugly password. And we'll talk about that in a second. And uh, the way you do this is you come up with a password that looks something like this. Now, how are you going to memorize this? Well, you do it in such a way that you come up with a password that instead of looking like this, you come up with something that is 12 characters, has two numbers, four special characters, upper lowercase. And oh, by the way, since I'm an old Beatles fan, there's a song, When I'm 64. And When I'm 64 has all of the credentials that I just, or criteria that I have there below. As you can see, the exclamation point, the numbers, the spaces, the, the little um, exclam uh, the tick for I'm. Um, and so therefore that's 12 characters and that qualifies as your master password. And that's only 12 characters. I really recommend using something longer. And so therefore even longer, if you said, will you still feed me when I'm 64? That's 36 characters. That'll never get broken. That is totally safe, safe, safe. So you just have to use a line from a song, a favorite poem, um, um, some sort of verse from somewhere and you're off to the races. So that's the way to do it. Now, the way it works is this, if you're not familiar, this is the way I like to explain it. And I'll use an ana analogy of uh, uh, like a, an index cards in a little box. This is the box of index cards. And each one of those little squares represents the credentials that are totally safe, safe, safe. And the way it works is that this is one of the index cards and it's got the URL and it's you have a uh, place called uh, where it says the name and you just make it... Uh, whatever you want, it's human readable. And then you've got the credentials down below. And as you can see, there's big, ugly passwords that um, the different vaults are able to generate for you. There's no time to be able to go in and tell you how to do it. But here's the way it works. When it's now loaded into your, your, your browser, you then go to a website like GoToMeeting and you get a little tiny box and got the arrow there. That little box says, okay, you're up and running. And that just happens to be what LastPass looks like. Oh, they're all different for, they got their own logos. And then you just basically say, yep, it's up and running. You just click on the little red box there. It all gets filled in for you. You have no idea what the password is for this. Big and ugly. And uh, it just squirts it in for you and you're in. Now I'm going to shift gears and say multi-factor authentication. This used to be something I used to have to push. Companies are really starting to move and do this much more often. And multi-factor authentication means it's something you know, something you have like authentication on your phone or an actual token, or now something getting more popular, some uh, biometrics, which is something you are. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take 30 seconds just to say, cause this is a senior group. I gave a speech on this to a, a, a crew of, um, uh, a thousand senior leaders in something called the FSI sec, the financial sector, ISEC, all senior people from the banking and uh, brokerage sector in the year 2000. And this was becoming more and more popular. And I stood in front of this group of a thousand people talking about eyeball scanning. And the reason I now use the term eyeball scanning is because I stood in front of a thousand people talking about retinal scanning. And I called it rectal scanning. So anyway, that's just the tell a little bit on me. So I hate the term retinal scanning. I'm just going to speak on this incredibly fast because I've only got a few minutes left. But what I want you to understand, if you're going onto the internet, when it's when you connect to the website, the website knows a lot about you. It knows your, your, your um, IP address, which they're able to quickly figure out where you are in the world. And uh, they can then figure out who you are and keep track of you. And um, this is how they, they store this in the cookies. This is really, really bad news when you're at a coffee shop, a hotel, at an airport, and you're able to connect to the coffee shop Wi-Fi and other people that are bad guys can be sitting there using tools, watching what you're doing and connecting. It's technical, can be done, not that hard. And um, 
You can also have somebody come in and, and create a little fake Wi-Fi that you connect to them. And then what happens is um, they're connected to the coffee shop and then you connect to the wrong uh, Wi-Fi and you connect to theirs and it looks like Starbucks two or something. And then you're in trouble. You're now a victim of what's known as a man in the middle attack. And um, what that means is the bad guy is now uh, able to see everything you see as you connect to um, the internet. So what's better is, and this is another product, just like having a vault, a different product is using uh, what's called a VPN, which connects you, you just connect every time to the VPN. I only use it when I'm at a hotel, airport, or at a coffee shop. You connect to the VPN, you then connect to the internet and uh, all the internet sees and is you the fact that uh, you coming from the VPN and the bad guys can't see you. Third party risk, I've only got two, three more minutes. I just wanna be able to say that my favorite company, Morgan Stanley, got hit recently for third party, um, that, that uh, they got a 60 million fine. So the point is people try and outsource a lot. This is a, a very, very popular thing to do these days, but you can outsource the authority, you can't outsource the responsibility. So you need to be able to check your third party vendors. I have a story I love to tell here. I'm gonna say it in about two minutes. I'll keep an eye on the clock, but something happened at Morgan Stanley that uh, drove me crazy. And that is uh, I was able, I had connections with the CIA, the, the FBI, worked very, very closely with the FBI. FBI would feed the financial sector data about stocks that are in play for um, fraud. Fraud is absolutely huge in the financial sector. I can't tell you the numbers. Just think a lot of zeros. And so I got this feed. I went to the, the head of trading and I said, hey, look, we've got this feed. Work together. We can go ahead and be able to, to eliminate a lot of the fraud. He said, this is a great idea. Let's do it. We went off and we talked to all the traders. We got them to all understand. And um, three months went by, nothing happened. I got a whole bunch of my, my senior people together. We did a think tank type of thing, busted our heads and, and it suddenly hit us like a ton of bricks. The reason is, is that these guys get paid and I'm using guys, male, female, they get paid for trading stocks. They don't get paid for preventing fraud. So we need to be able to build it in. Remember I said about the, the incentive with the factory, same thing, if you build it in to where you're able to reward these traders to prevent the fraud, and they're happy to help. So let's finish up here and say that cybersecurity is not a project. You don't go to the gym on January 1st, do a thousand pushups and say, okay, I'm good until Thanksgiving. It's a program. You got to show up often and you got to be able to work it every single day. So we'll wrap it up and we'll say it's the culture. People are the biggest risk. Make sure, just like I said about the digital exhaust, it can be used against you. That's correlated data. Use a VPN, use a vault, and remember it's a project, not a program. So here we go. I didn't leave very much time for questions, but let's let's uh, let's bring me back in and I'll open it up. Oop. Actually, I'll leave myself small so you can see who I am. How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. Will you make your presentation available to us? Yes, I, I will make this, pre I will get it to um, my host uh, as soon as this is over. I didn't get time to do it ahead of time. Yeah, and actually David asked a good question. David Burr, thanks. Um, like show of hands, how many of us are actually using password managers and multi-factor authentication, VPNs, et cetera? Prior I would never embarrass anybody. <laughs> and by the way, no. uh, I, I know I was speaking fast, but I wanted to get it all in. Um, my wife, who hates technology even today, when I made her move to LastPass when we got married, because LastPass has been a while, around a while, she's like, I don't right. want to do it. She went kicking and screaming, and she now you could pry it out of her dead hands because it's so easy to use. She's like, no, you're not taking it away from me. And I told her, honey, we have to get off last pass. She's like, okay, we'll do it. But I, you know, I, I can't wait to get on the new one because it just makes life easy. 
Kurt, what's your view on passwordless uh, environments, especially for corporate environments? What does that mean? I'll answer the question once I understand. Uh, like uh, double secret octopus or... Uh, you mean like in terms Kronos of quality? One. Yeah, well, as, as opposed to having a vault and allowing the employee to do any of their password uh generation at all that just does the authentication keeps it in a vault with a third party and then no it it can also it do more it encrypts yeah. all your passwords you don't even know what they are just like yeah, just which like is a good thing. vault does yeah yeah and so to to your point though i've been in places where the it the it people are really trying to be good and by the way this also included when i was with the government and so they give you a password one of those big ugly ones and that's when people write them down. They put them in their phone. They put them in there. Everybody does this. I used to do it too. Let's be honest. You know, you put it in your um, in your phone, in your contact list, and then your phone gets lost, your phone gets breached, you're in trouble. So the whole thing is, is that um, I'm a big vault advocate because when you use a vault um, and uh, you, you, people can use their, their passwords both for professional and personal. And the big thing about a vault is, is that I can share passwords like, um, um, like let's just say for our Cisco routers at a big company, we can share the password and people don't need to be able to see what that password is. They just use the, the, the software. And so therefore when we fire that person or the person decides to leave, we no longer share it with them. They no longer have access. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it does get back to no matter how good your password is, if it's a big, ugly password, someone's going to write it down or put it in their phone. Right. Sure. <laughs> and and I, I, there's a lot more to the, the, the way the vaults work. And uh, they're not perfect. None of them are perfect. But you learn to work around it. My wife learned how to work around it. But the really cool thing is, it's like, I just recently had to go to eBay and change my password. And when I got to eBay to change my password, the vault stepped in and said, how about we change it for you? And I just had to click on it and it made a big, ugly password I never needed to see. So, yeah. And that shouldn't be confused with multi-factor, by the way, with the, with the, the authenticators. I, I've got too many authenticators. That's a different problem that are on your phone. They're, they're good. Does that answer the question or do you feel I dodged it? Uh, no, mm -hmm. passwordless uh, environments are, are basically the same as your vault. They're, you know, you create your profile. It's secured um, in a place where authentication of you is only done by the third party. And then, uh, and then the third party takes care of all your password access through encrypted passwords. You don't even know what they are, so you can't share them or lose them. So, right. Is there a product for doing this? When you say well, yeah, secret uh, uh, hypers one, secret double octopus is another. Uh, a lot of big corporations go to those. They they Give try me the them names again. On... I'm I'm a real honest guy. I'll yeah, always admit see, if I don't see, know. Try secret double octopus SDO. That's one. Hyper <laughs> is their competitor. Um, I think Kronos One is another. Gartner's been looking at these. Uh, but I, no, I know, do it. yeah, SDO came out early on. Um, they get, they got a lot of traction. They became somewhat popular. Hyper followed them. Um, Kronos One is in there. That's a third one. They they all, you know, kind of work off the same concept, encrypted passwords, which the user doesn't know what they are. So the user can't. Yep. Can't, right. The internal, uh, the human factor is the the highest risk you've got. But if the person Spot doesn't on. know it, they can't give it away. Can't give You're away right. something you don't know. Spot on. You you know, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, but I would really be interested to see what the market penetration is of these products, because I am devastated by what the market penetration is. I just well, I, I know some of your big uh, some of your big government um suppliers vendors i mean yeah. big some of the biggest ones you can think of are moving towards these platforms uh for their you know but they've got big workforces right yes yes and they will they want to take out of the and and your users like it because once the authentication is done by the third party group uh say for secret double octopus once your 
cyber team gets people authenticated into the product, you never think about a password again, ever. Yeah. It just goes in and there's no update except when you're onboarded or offboarded. That's it. And, doesn't matter and, to me how it's done. I love the idea. So whether yeah, but I think uh, unlike your example, there's literally no customer. Mm -hmm. The cut the user is is incredibly happy because passwords have become a non-issue to them. Yep, completely. There's no maintenance. There's no training anymore because now they're enrolled in the platform which the corporation's using for two hundred and fifty thousand people, and. I never have to touch a password again unless it's on a personal side. This is something I need to learn about. Thank you. It's a broad field. <laughs> Ever changing. Ever changing. Yes, yes. sir. Thank you. You're welcome.